Open Your Eyes is brought to you by the Belize Bank. Our country, your bank. And good morning, Belize. Welcome to Open Your Eyes, Start Your Morning Right. Um, I'm Gavin Courtney, and welcome to our show. Um, I'm flying solo this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful Thursday morning. It's almost Friday, so I know that if you're like me, you're getting ready for the weekend, getting ready to do some fun stuff. And um, before you can make your plans, hopefully we are going to be checking in on our weather right now, and here we are. And we're checking in with Angelia Guy. Good morning. Oh, well, good morning. Do we have and do we have Angelia? Hi, good morning, yes. Hi, how are we doing? I'm good, and you? All right, I'm doing great. I am really uh, looking forward to hearing about what our weather is gonna be like. So uh, what's our general situation looking like? Okay, well, we have a warm southeasterly airflow prevailing over the area. Okay, and um, so for the next 24 hours, what are we looking at? Okay, we're looking at for during the day, sunny and warm conditions, and it's also a bit hazy outside, and then tonight we expect partly cloudy and fairly cooler temperatures. Okay, and speaking of those temperatures, what are our highs looking at like today? Okay, today the high temperatures will peak at about 88 degrees per night along the coast and soaring to about 96 inland and 90 in the hills. And tonight the low temperatures will fall to about 76 degrees per night along the coast, 72 inland and 66 in the hills. And what about our winds? Okay, for today the winds will continue to blow from the southeast and south at 10 to 20 knots with occasional hair gusts. And uh, do we have any advisories or warnings? Yes, we have a small craft crash on an effect for the occasional gusty winds and locally rough seas. And what about um, the outlook for the next few days? Okay, we're expecting generally fair weather to continue with little or no rainfall. Um, expect, expect for isolated showers to occur mostly offshore and over the south tomorrow. All right then. Um, well, thank you, um, Angelia, for that update. You're welcome. All right. And so there you have it. You can make your weekend plans. Uh, there may be there may be a few showers tomorrow, but uh, feel free to make your weekend plans. Um, it seems like it's going to be nice and sunny. Um, so. Uh, Moving right along with our show, um, we've had your weather, so now we have a little bit of morning motivation for you. Um, so we do have our eye opener today, and that is taken from dailyom.com, and um, here's our morning message for you. You can channel your pain into helping others and spreading a tide of curative energy throughout the world. Pain is a fact of being and one that permeates all of our lives to some degree. Since the hurt we feel may be part of the experiences that have touched us most deeply, we don't want to let go. It's frequently easier to keep our pain at our sides, where it acts as a shield that shelters us from others and gives us an identity, that of a victim, from which we can draw bitter strength. However, pain's universality can also empower us to use our hurt to help others heal. Since no pain is any greater or more profound than any other, what you feel can give you the ability to help bring about the recovery of individuals whose hurts are both similar to and vastly different from your own. You can channel your pain into transformative, transformative and healing love that aids you in helping individuals on a one-to-one -one basis and spreading a tide of curative energy throughout the world. Our courageous decision to reach out to others can be the best way to declare yourself and to the world that your pain didn't defeat you, and in fact, it helped you heal. So uh, that, 
of course, is a very powerful message and it's one that resonates with me a lot. Um, it certainly is uh, something that I think about um, and we always uh, think about, I always think about it in the context of uh, how we can come together and share because a lot of the time when we're going through something bad or when we have been through a bad experience, um, we don't necessarily like to share it with others um, uh, and we don't realize that it can be part of the healing process for you and it's also an opportunity to um, share something in common with somebody else or also to um, help them because you never know what somebody else is going through so you never know that even sharing an experience that you've had in your past um, might help somebody else and uh, the more we do um, take control of ourselves and, and, and share with others we also have a chance to grow and um, get even uh, build strength from the pain as um, it said and it could be a whole lot of things it could be something um, physical that you went through an injury or something that really took you a while to get over um, you know leading on support from others and sharing how you got through that might help somebody in a similar situation S certainly with emotional issues um, we uh, can share a, a, a lot I would say can come from shared experiences um, we can help each other through um, a whole lot of different things and of course it, it also helps with giving advice you know if you know that somebody if you see the signs that somebody else is going through something maybe similar that you went to um, then you know you can build on your experience help and it will help you grow and it will help them have an easier time um, so I really do like that message and um, you can feel free to you know chime in on our website chime in on our Facebook to let us know um, how you feel about uh, the uh, our eye opener as always and um, what, how you feel about today's and share any experiences that you have we do uh, we'd love to hear from you um, but with that said um, we can um, <coughs> jump uh, right into our show for today um, so uh, we do want to remind you guys that we do have a promotion coming up and that is for uh, it's February so that obviously means it's Valentine's Day so if you want to share if you want to surprise um, a loved one maybe you um, are a secret admirer of someone or maybe you want to do something like surprise the one, your special someone by um, proposing to them live on air we are gonna have a Valentine's show on Valentine's Day and um, we um, uh, are accepting um, calls um, or messages that we want to send to your loved one on that um, very, very, very special day. So we are reminding you of that. Okay. Um, one other thing that's very, uh, one other super important and special thing is that we are going to have an update from our reporter um, Hippolito Novello, um, who, as you may know, is currently in Utah following um, the, tr the explosive trial um, that is going on um, regarding uh, Mr. Derman. I don't know if you've been watching. All right, we've got Hippolito on the line. All right, uh, good morning. Hi, morning, Gavin. All right, hi, Hippolito. How are we doing? I'm good, good, good. How are you? I'm doing well too, um, and I'm sure, like everybody else, I'm waiting to hear some of the updates from uh, the proceedings that are going on in Utah right now. Sure. Well, the biggest thing that happened yesterday was that Jacob Kingston mm -hmm. he finally took the stand. Now, this is the witness for the prosecution, and everyone has been waiting for him to testify. Um, what the prosecution did yesterday is to lay some foundation in terms of who um, Mr. Kingston is, mm -hmm. his childhood, how he grew up, and his lifestyle. Um, as you may know, um, it has been reporting that Kingston, along with his brother, belong to this polygamous sect here in Utah. Um, and while the prosecution didn't use the word polygamy, they laid the foundation in terms of his lifestyle. Uh, according to what Mr. Kingston answered, he has about three wives, well, one wife and two other uh, common relationships. He has about 20 children, and this is what his family, this is like a tradition for them. 
Yeah, he explained that his father has about 100, about 100 children. Wow. So <laughs> that, that's the um, polygamy um, portion of it that came out at the, at the beginning of his um, questioning. Now, in terms of Belize, nothing, nothing was mentioned um, about Belize by Mr. Kingston. Yeah. As I said, the prosecution is still laying the foundation, and hopefully... Um, they will get to believe that either today or Friday. Mr. Kingston testified today, whole day today, the entire day today, yeah. and will do so on Friday. And I believe he will be cross-examined by Monday. So he will be on, on the stand for the remainder of the week and up to up to Monday. Um, so nothing much has happened in terms of the belief angle. Mm -hmm. um, hoping, again, hoping that Kingston and the prosecution will focus a little, hopefully, on, on those text messages that we have been reporting on um, in terms of uh, John Saldiva and the allegations against this, this minister. Yeah, I'm sure that we uh, definitely are going to be um, eagerly waiting for that update. Um, what's the general feeling um, about uh, these proceedings uh, over there in Utah? Well, um, when I saw Mr. Lev Berman to, um, yesterday, he seemed very relaxed. You yeah. know, he was with his attorneys um, in terms of the lead attorney, Mr. Mark Garagos. He didn't seem much bothered. Uh, we know that, I know that he stared at Mr. Kingston for a few minutes. Kingston, he seems very relaxed as well. He entered the courtroom in what appeared to be prison attire, blue prison attire. Yeah. He was shackled. One of his hands was shackled to his waist, um, and only his right hand was, was free, you know, um, and he was under every, every security guard. Um, one of the security officers, I believe, of our agents, um, was beside him for the duration of his testimony um, yesterday evening. So he's under a heavy police guard. He, put it, he can't take footage of uh, Mr. Kingston and Jacob because they are in detention, and it's not like they leave to the front door of the, of the court um, house uh, yeah. building. You know, they have their security escort and to, to risk them away to jail every time they... they the court finishes. So today, uh, because of the snow and the weather here, and some concerns that some of the jurors have expressed to the, to the judge, we are going to start trial one hour late. That will be at 10 o'clock um, here. And uh, what the federal judge indicated yesterday was that they will break um, soon, sooner um, today, Thursday. So I'm thinking about 4 o'clock or before 4 o'clock they will break. And this might happen against Friday if it continues with this sort of weather to allow the jurors to um, return home safely because some of them were complaining that they have to drive or, or they have to catch the 4.15, um, 5.20 um, train. And if, they, if we break off at 5 o'clock, then they won't be able to make it. So hopefully um, what comes up today as new to believe in terms of that text messages, in terms of those gaming licenses that was um, acquired by Lev German, and anything that has to do with the property there, the corridor free zone. Yeah. All right. So we are definitely going to be waiting for those updates um, very anxiously. And of course, uh, good luck to you on your reporting while you're there. Thank you very much for giving us that update this morning. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Gavin. All right. Um, so uh, with that, we will um, move right along. So um, once again, our uh, reporter Hippolito Novello is currently in Salt Lake City, Utah, following uh, the cr um, ongoing criminal proceedings against uh, Lev Derman and, and, as he said, uh, Mr. Jacob Kingston, who um, uh, was alleging to have had um, uh, taken over um, payments uh, to um, allegedly one of our uh, ministers, uh, John Saldivar. Um, so he's going to be giving evidence today and uh, tomorrow, and he's going to be cross-examined. And we are going to be waiting for any updates from Hippolito to see if uh, any of those allegations are repeated or if Belize does come up in any way in these proceedings. And we will definitely be keeping you updated here on Open Your Eyes and, um, of course, on our evening Channel 5 news. Um, but. Uh, jumping into today's show, we do have a great show lined up for you today. Um, for our first uh, 
oh, uh, conversation, we do, we are going to be speaking about uh, the European Union and the Latin American and Caribbean Foundation with uh, the ambassador for the European Union to Belize. Um, for our second conversation, we are going to be speaking to the Belize School Counselors Association and they're going to discuss uh, the School Counselors Association Awareness Week. That's going to be a great conversation. And finally, um, I'm very excited and you probably will be too. We are going to be uh, speaking with the winners from the dog, uh, BDF dog show competition which was just held uh, last weekend. So we are going to see some of the, tri the tricks uh, that helped them win uh, the show. So that's going to be a whole lot of fun. Um, and before we close off, we do have one very special uh, birthday to mention. And so today, um, all of us at Open Your Eyes and Channel 5 want to send a very, very, very happy birthday to Jocelyn McCoy. So um, happy birthday, Jocelyn. We hope that you um, enjoy your special day. And all of us here at Open Your Eyes are wishing you a very, very special day. And um, we just want to remind you viewers that you can submit a birthday request to our email or our Facebook page. So if you want to show some love and appreciation to somebody who you're close to on their special day, please feel free to contact us and we will send a birthday shout out. But with that said, we are going to be taking our first break. And when we come back, we are going to be joined by the ambassador for the European Union to Belize. So uh, stay tuned. You don't want to miss that conversation. And we'll be right back. With over 100 years of service excellence in Belize,
And we are back and we are jumping right into our first conversation and we are going to be learning all about uh, the European Union and the Latin America and the Caribbean Foundation. And joining us uh, for this discussion is uh, Ms. Paula Amadei, who is a former European Union ambassador to Belize and is currently the executive director of uh, the EU uh, Latin America and Caribbean Foundation. Um, good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning and thank you to you for offering me this uh, opportunity to come back to Open Your Eyes. Uh, oh. Some of your viewers can still remember me <laughs> from the time I used to mm -hmm. come regularly to Belize. I was a EU ambassador to Belize from uh, uh, 2012 mm. to uh, 2016. Okay. Uh, but during four years I didn't come back and this is my first uh, mission to Belize in my new capacity okay. as uh, executive director of this uh, new organization. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you for having me here. Oh, we're very pleased to have you. How does it feel to be back after four years? <laughs> oh, it's just coming back home. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> First, uh, there are a lot of known faces uh, in offices uh, uh, and uh, I find always uh, pleasant uh, to be here in uh, Belize City facing the Caribbean Sea oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with the nice breeze uh, uh, of, the, of the sea, so uh, it's very good to be back. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you here. <laughs> So we are speaking about uh, the EU LAC Foundation today. So maybe for our viewers, you can um, sort of explain to us what uh, the foundation is and how it came about. Yeah, the uh, foundation, EU LAC Foundation, where EU stands for European Union, uh, LAC for Latin American Caribbean, was created uh, back in 2010. Uh, and it was a decision of the head of state and government of the 61 countries and of the European Union. So it was uh, a major decision. 2011, uh, the foundation was established in Hamburg, Germany, where we have our headquarters. Uh, since then, uh, the foundation has been transformed into an international organization. We are probably the youngest international organization. Uh, we officially became one on 17 May 2019. And we are probably the smallest or one of the smallest uh, since we have a very small staff of nine people. Uh, Belize, uh, uh, it's indeed a, a member, a full member, and uh, something that I think will be interesting for your viewers, it's the fact that Belize was uh, the first country in Latin America and the Caribbean to sign and ratify the constitutive agreement of the foundation, so it was trailblazing uh, for the <laughs> other. Uh, the objective of the foundation is to strengthen and develop uh, the connection between the two regions and in particular to involve the, in the relation civil society in all its forms. For that reason uh, our uh, uh, mandate uh, is uh, to uh, incorporate in the process uh, of the bi-regional dialogue uh, civil society. We work together with uh, university and university association, for instance, uh, Universities Caribbean. Mm -hmm. We work together with uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, or organization of uh, uh, businesses. We work together with uh, NGOs of different kind and uh, we organize uh, initiatives that complement the activities of our member states uh, in uh, this area. Uh, maybe it's useful to make a few concrete examples oh, for sure. your viewers. Um, 
2018, the ministers of foreign affairs of the 61 countries and the, of the European Union met and uh, decided that they wanted to develop uh, initiative uh, in the cultural sphere to okay. develop uh, um, activities uh, uh, involving the countries of the two regions in the protection of uh, the cultural heritage uh, or in the development uh, of the culture and creative industry or, and that's uh, also a very interesting part, uh, to see the role that cultural institutions in the two regions could uh, work together to promote uh, common values, to promote peace, and to raise awareness uh, uh, on global concern, yes. for instance, uh, climate change. Yes, for sure. Based uh, on this, uh, the foundation uh, organized uh, uh, two gatherings uh, uh, last year, one uh, dedicated to uh, experts uh, and cultural manager uh, from across uh, the two regions, and in the case uh, of Belize, uh, there was a representative uh, of the uh, National Institute for uh, Culture. Uh, and th then a second meeting where cultural expert uh, and uh, um, manager met uh, together with representative of the ministries of mm -hmm. culture. Uh, and the objective of these two meetings was sort of to prepare the ground to identify which could be this common uh, initiative yes, yes. Uh, involving all countries. And the idea was uh, to have uh, a discussion uh, with the people dealing uh, with culture on a daily basis uh, to see which proposal they would have, and then test of this proposal with uh, the government representative. Okay. Well. And also in mm -hmm. the last meeting for government, again, there was mm. a representative uh, from uh, Belize. Uh, we have paid particular attention to have the voices of smaller countries uh, and uh, of countries in the Caribbean uh, heard mm -hmm. in uh, uh, the different fora. All right. And um, I'm sure like uh, a lot of people are probably, um, you know, wondering uh, how this uh, improved relationship through the foundation yeah. can, can impact the future relations between all of the countries, states. Is yeah. Uh, indeed. Uh, there is a political dialogue going on, but we know as well that sometimes political dialogue uh, at high level might be hampered by specific situation. And this uh, has been uh, the case now uh, in uh, the dialogue between EU, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Uh, however, what we have seen as well, that uh, uh, dialogue at technical level and dialogue of civil society, it's a dialogue that uh, can continue independently from what might be situation affecting uh, uh, government uh, discussion. And uh, we think that there is a lot of value added in allowing uh, organization of civil societies uh, having contact at by regional level, exchanging good practices, uh, establishing connection, uh, and uh, that these at the end uh, can also improve uh, the dialogue uh, of government. Uh, it's complementary to the dialogue of government, but it can also be uh, given additional impulse uh, to the dialogue uh, uh, between governments. Uh, and it brings to the table uh, subjects uh, that possibly are not uh, on the priority list of government, but they are relevant uh, for uh, uh, citizens. One example uh, for 
few years now, we have been organizing meeting uh, of youth from the two regions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the last meeting we organized was dedicated to youth and volunteering. It's a, an area where uh, youth uh, participate uh, in both uh, of our region. There are a lot of organization uh, channeling the efforts of youth uh, at the national level, but also internationally. And uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, better uh, connection between these different organizations could improve also the way uh, these efforts uh, can be channeled and uh, uh, can be brought to fruition to society. For instance, to see which experiences exist uh, to recognize volunteer works by youth uh, in their CV. Mm -hmm. A lot of students uh, hand uh, their studies uh, and they don't have a so-called practical experience mm -hmm. because they haven't had yet uh, the possibility to work uh, formally. So the fact uh, that they can uh, bring uh, the attention to their efforts as volunteers uh, can uh, give them uh, a, an advantage uh, in the labor market. And it's something that should be encouraged uh, and uh, should be valued. We hear a lot about youth uh, not participating, youth uh, being uh, uh, apathetic towards uh, development, uh, but I think uh, the, there is sufficient evidence to the contrary. Yeah. And uh, our intention uh, now for 2020 is to organize uh, a meeting of uh, volunteering organization, particularly those as uh, regional or sub-regional uh, level, to see if we can uh, favor the creation of a network of volunteering organization across uh, the two regions, and uh, how we can uh, favor the exchange of good practices among them. All right. And um, you mentioned earlier that um, you know, the foundation is somewhat young, and it's also uh, the staff is somewhat small. So how? Uh, how easy or difficult is it to put together projects to facilitate uh, or further the objectives of the yeah. foundation? The way we work, uh, and uh, it's not just out of necessity, but it's a conviction of the foundation, we work uh, uh, with other organizations. We seek uh, uh, synergies with other organizations uh, that have a similar objective uh, or uh, we, um, we share uh, uh, the similar objective. For instance, a uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, we were in uh, the island of Antigua talking uh, about uh, um, migrants' policies, how um, government across uh, the two regions accommodates the needs of their own migrants, uh, how they help them uh, uh, maintaining the connection uh, to the home country. And uh, for this uh, particular event, we had the support of the University of the West Indies, of the organization Universities Caribbean, and uh, of uh, the uh, German Institute for Global and Area Studies, uh, GIGA. So pulling together all these resources, together with the support of the government of Antigua and Barbuda, allowed us uh, to develop this uh, activity. So that's something uh, we do for all uh, our uh, initiative. And, uh, we are not looking for a monopoly mm -hmm. on uh, bi-regional relation. To the contrary, uh, our objective is to create uh, a very solid uh, network uh, of uh, stakeholders, uh, government and non-government, uh, uh, cooperating together. If you go to the website of the foundation, it's easy to find. It's called ulacfoundation.org. Mm -hmm 
There you can see, for instance, that we have uh, a database called MAPEO, where organizations uh, uh, that have an interest to cooperate uh, with the other region can register. It doesn't imply any cost. Mm -hmm. You register there, and it's a database uh, with a lot of search. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to make uh, more visible your activities uh, and uh, your work. Something else uh, we do, we favor um, research, uh, bringing together the perspective uh, of uh, the two regions. So I brought you here this pen and uh, here you have an UBS key with all our 40-something publication. <laughs> and uh, uh, for the public, uh, they can uh, find this pul publication and they can download uh, them for free from our website. And uh, they are both uh, in English and Spanish, mm -hmm. so uh, they can come and also for the public here uh, in Belize. And uh, they cover different uh, aspects. Uh, for instance, uh, we have been writing about uh, uh, trade, we have been writing about uh, uh, instrument of protection of democracy, about uh, access to the labor market, uh, about uh, um, vocational training. Our next publication uh, that uh, it's currently in preparation will de be dedicated to the green bonds market, uh, those financial instruments for the funding uh, of uh, uh, investment uh, to uh, mitigate uh, or adapt to climate change. Uh, therefore, there are different uh, areas we cover, and the idea is uh, to favor more uh, by regional uh, uh, perspective uh, on uh, subject and not having just uh, the perspective of one uh, region, but also through this document uh, to provide uh, uh, scientific uh, support to the dialogue uh, uh, between uh, government uh, and civil society. All right. And um, since you mentioned trade, I think um, whenever anybody hears about international um, organizations or uh, relations, that's automatically the first thing I think, trade, investment. Um, what are some of the ways in which the foundation can, uh, well, facilitates that sort of activity? I would be over ambitious, <laughs> uh, especially taking into account that there are major organizations <laughs> specialized uh, in uh, promoting trade uh, and supporting trade uh, to say that uh, this is uh, uh, an area where the uh, foundation can uh, um, have a major impact. Nevertheless, uh, if you go uh, to uh, the uh, library of the foundation, you will find, for instance, uh, that we have uh, uh, published uh, an atlas of uh, um, industrial clusters. So uh, it's uh, uh, um, covering uh, at the moment uh, 10 countries in Latin America and allows you to see for those countries uh, where there are concentration of specific industries. So it's a way internationally also to make investor more aware of concentration of small uh, and medium-sized uh, enterprises uh, and uh, to look uh, in a uh, better way to uh, the existing market and investment uh, opportunities uh, that it would otherwise be the case. We have also uh, tried uh, constantly to favor more connection uh, among small and medium-sized enterprises. For instance, uh, favoring also exchange of experience uh, between uh, industrial cluster. So it's not necessarily uh, the magic uh, solution, <laughs> also because we all know the small and medium uh, size enterprises participate only very marginally to international trade. At the same time, uh, 
for a small and medium-sized enterprise, the fact of being exposed uh, to other experiences can make uh, a tremendous difference uh, in uh, deciding uh, to launch itself in the international market and explore new market uh, niche. So, uh, we hope that with this initiative uh, we can uh, uh, make a difference and indeed uh, there we seek the cooperation uh, of uh, other programs and projects or institutions. For instance, uh, uh, two years ago we organized uh, a uh, exploratory mission from uh, enterprises, from businesses, from Baltic country, from Lithuania, Estonia and uh, Latvia, to Costa Rica and to Chile to explore possibility of cooperation uh, with uh, um, businesses from those countries in uh, the area of the e-industry, in the area of uh, the information and communication technology. So there are a few examples as I say, not magic bullets, <laughs> uh, but uh, a way to contribute uh, to uh, strengthen also in this uh, area more cooperation. Right. And um, of course, the foundation itself, the work is very multifaceted in terms of its um, objectives. But are there any uh, particular areas of focus that um, the foundation is looking at um, developing perhaps in 2020 and beyond? Yeah. Uh, indeed, uh, we have focused on certain uh, areas uh, that have been decided in agreement with our member states. From the very beginning, one area of cooperation was uh, academic uh, cooperation. It's very relevant for Europe, very relevant for Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, there, what uh, we have uh, uh, managed is to um, convene a um, dialogue uh, between organization, academic uh, organization uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean and in Europe to identify objective uh, and instrument and possible project to make, uh, um, to realize uh, this uh, long-term project uh, of a common area of uh, higher education. Now, it seems very abstract, but uh, if you have been a student uh, uh, trying to go to uh, a, a third country and then coming back, you will realize that sometimes it's difficult to have your studies uh, recognized in your country of origin or vice versa, to have the study of your country of origin recognized in a third country. The objective of creating a common area of higher education between the two regions is to facilitate the mobility of students and academics between the two regions. The motto of universities in this century, it's uh, internationalization. Mm -hmm. uh, internationalization of your program, uh, internationalization of your faculty, internationalization of the curricula of your students. Uh, so the possibility for a student to, to spend a semester in a different university in another member state and coming back to Belize and having the credit uh, of this semester recognized, uh, it's uh, uh, a contribution mm -hmm. to uh, internationalization. To have uh, uh, more uh, uh, comparable standards uh, among universities in the two regions uh, would uh, allow also to raise collectively our standards uh, on education. Um, we have to take into account that especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, a majority of students now in university are 
going to university as first one in their families. So this represents a major ticket to social improvement. But in order for this to be uh, effective, we need also to secure that the uh, higher education is a, a quality education and uh, uh, that uh, the standards uh, that uh, we uh, promote are standards that are internationally accepted. And that is true for all the countries. We have sometimes seen the proliferation of what in some countries, I don't know if uh, that's uh, the term used in Belize, it's called uh, garage university. So there are not uh, university of the standard of the University of Belize. Uh, they are uh, universities that are just created uh, in order to capture uh, resources, but without providing uh, quality education. And uh, we need to avoid uh, that uh, people, families, enroll uh, their children in such university and then to discover that uh, the title they have received, it's not a title that uh, it's uh, valued in the labor market because it's not supported by a solid organization. Yeah. And um, what ways uh, do you see um, it uh, in the future impacting, um, you spoke about culture earlier, so, um, you know, looking forward, I suppose, what, what, what ways do you think the foundation will impact um, the cultural relations in betwe between, you know, the region, the two regions, sorry. Yeah. I think uh, the two regions have uh, common cultural uh, heritage, or part of it uh, as common cultural heritage, and there is a lot, uh, a great demand from uh, uh, cultural expert and manager of the two regions to be able to work more mm -hmm. together, uh, to exchange uh, experiences, uh, to be able to spend uh, uh, short term uh, um, sort of fellowship uh, uh, periods in museums uh, in the other region uh, to exchange experience. There is, for instance, a very interesting uh, a suggestion coming from the two meetings we have organized to uh, have uh, a sort of curator or conservators without borders, uh, allowing uh, a group of conservators uh, uh, of the two regions to come together and intervene in uh, a cultural institution uh, that Otherwise, I couldn't afford to have uh, such a specialist uh, on a permanent basis. But they could, for instance, uh, help uh, in creating an exhibition or in uh, uh, the restoration of specific item. Another very interesting uh, suggestion that I would hope uh, we can realize uh, is uh, uh, to develop uh, um, by regional cultural roots. Uh, here in uh, uh, this continent uh, there are already cultural roots dedicated to specific products, uh, for instance rum or coffee mm -hmm. or cocoa uh, or the Inca um, uh, path uh, mm -hmm. across uh, several uh, countries. And in Europe, uh, the Council of Europe have developed a network of cultural routes. And it's a different way to approach uh, tourism and to approach uh, the knowledge of the country. Typically, these routes are traversing uh, different countries, so they create people-to-people -people connection in an unconventional way, and I think this can also contribute to the final goal of promoting peace and better understanding uh, among uh, people. Uh, so I hope uh, some of these uh, suggestions can uh, uh, be 
implemented in the ground. During uh, my stay here in Belize, uh, I will meet a representative of government. I will also have a meeting at the University of Belize with uh, its president. And uh, I hope we can see also uh, a larger participation from Belizean uh, institutions and individuals uh, in our activities. I would just like to take the opportunity to mention a program that might be of interest for your viewers. I say the Foundation is a very small organization. Uh, our work is also supported by interns that rotate in our quarter in Hamburg. So every three months we receive three to four interns from across the 61 countries. And so far, we have had uh, over 80 young people uh, uh, coming to work with us during uh, uh, a short period. And we would like to see um, application coming from Belize. There might have been application in the past, but uh, I don't remember any. Uh, but definitely we had never had uh, an intern coming from Belize, while we have had from other countries in the Caribbean. And therefore, today, here, and tomorrow also, when I will be at the University of Belize, uh, I will uh, make a call uh, <laughs> to see application coming from Belize. It's a very interesting experience. We uh, request or we ask for our uh, interns uh, to be bilingual, uh, Spanish and English. And I know that several students here in Belize comply with uh, this condition already. And uh, uh, it's a good experience because you are in a small organization, so you are involved in all the steps uh, of the process. Uh, uh, so it's a, a good way if you are interested in an international career, in a career. Also in communication, we always need uh, uh, interns also with a passion for communication uh, to start uh, at the foundation. Hmm. And if any of our viewers wanted to apply, where should they look? Uh, Again, uh, mm -hmm. the website, uh, ulacfoundation.org, uh, existing both in Spanish and English. You can find all the information. There is uh, a, a, a part called Opportunities, and there you will find the information on the internship. But also, for instance, for call for proposals. Uh, once a year, we publish uh, it's just an example. We publish several calls for proposal every year, but one example, every year we publish a call for proposal to co-financing of uh, uh, events, uh, seminar, for uh, meeting, uh, with uh, bi-regional content at, and with bi-regional uh, uh, participants. So um, again, we were checking, uh, we have never received an application from an organization in Belize, uh, and we would salute uh, for the next call uh, for co-financing of events that will be launched toward the end of this year to see uh, application from, uh, from Belize as well. All right. Um, so you heard that. If you are interested in applying for, uh, if, for one of these positions, please visit their website. And um, Paola, we want to thank you for coming into our show again and um, sharing all of this information about the foundation. Um, it was a pleasure having you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure for me. And uh, just a remark. Uh, I'm very pleased to see, after four years that I wasn't coming, uh, the awareness raising campaign against uh, uh, single-use plastic. Six, yes. And I think that's uh, a great step. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, the public uh, uh, follow uh, this uh, campaign and take action.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, too. Um, so uh, once again, uh, uh, Paula Amade is uh, the executive director of uh, the EU LAC Foundation. And as you may know her, a former ambassador um, for the EU to Belize. Um, coming in to share, about, to share all of this information about the foundation and the work that it does. Now, um, w we are going to take our, fir our break right now, and we, when we come back, we are going to be joined by the Belize School Counselors Association, and they're going to be telling us all about the School Counselors Association Awareness Week. Um, so please stay tuned. Uh, we will be right back. Sixty-five years ago,
back. Um, it is uh, the School Counselors Association Awareness Week and joining us here to talk about all of that for our second conversation are representatives from the association. So um, with us right now on my left we've got Carol Brennan who is the teacher and counselor for our government primary school and she's also the president of the association. Um, we also have Crystal Jones, who is a teacher and counselor from Palote High School. Uh, she's a public relations officer for the association as well. Uh, to my right, we have Mariselli Soberanis, who is the counselor for Wesley College and the secretary of the association. And we also have Samson Jacob, who is a counselor from Sadie Vernon Technical High School. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank, thank you for having us. So, um, before we jump into our conversation about um, the Awareness Week, perhaps, um, Carol, you can tell us all about the association and what um, your objectives are. Okay, so the School Counselor Association was incorporated as an association in 2012, August 13, 2012. Um, the work began actually in 2009. Um, there was a previous organization before us for guidance counselors, and I'm not sure what happened and that association went dormant. But in 2009, with the help of Dr. Charlene Smith, she's a Belizean um, school counselor in the United States, they, were jump they jump started a group starting to work on putting together articles of association, code of ethics, the role of school counselors, and we officially incorporated in 2012. So our goal is to get school counselors and police together. We try to represent school counselors nationally, across educational levels, across denominations, to put forward what we need as counselors. At present, we are employed as teachers with counseling responsibilities. In our education rule, there is not a job description for school counselors. So if we're hired as just counselors, then we have a chance of not getting our benefits because we're not teachers. So that's one of the fights that we have. We're trying to get together all the counselors nationwide so that we can put together what we need as school counselors. And one of them is the changing of the education rules to have the school counselor job description so that we're on the same page as to what we should be doing in schools. At present, the book stops at the administrators. So in the different high schools, the administrators really determine what the school counselors do. We should be teaching life skills and working with our students. Unfortunately, some of our counselors are teaching other subjects, our heads of departments, so the ti their time is really split and they're not getting to do the school counseling work that they should be doing. Um, another thing for us is to provide networking. As counselors, we're dealing with other people's problems all day. That is by nature our job. So we need to provide networking and support for each other. And another thing is the qualifications. A lot of us do not have the necessary training in school counseling or in counseling per se. We have a lot of our members who are social workers who have the degree in social work and that does have a counseling aspect. But we have people who don't have anything, not in psychology, not in um, school counseling or mental health counseling. They were kind of grandfathered in to the role as school counselors, which we understand because school counseling originally started as guidance counseling and it was more helping students to choose a career path, but that has since evolved. So at this point, we're trying to get our counselors to come together so that we can work collectively to gather data so that we can show the ministry, you know, we, there is a need for more school counselors. There is a need to change these rules so that we have more time to deal with the issues that our kids have in schools today. All right, and how big is the association? We have a membership of about 50 at this present moment. Um, the turnover is very high because of the, the changing rules, because of the, the level of work that you have to deal with with some of these students. Um, the, the membership list, if we go back to like 20, 2011 when we were sending emails and all that, we have way above 50. But the turnover people keep changing jobs, going maybe into social work or going outside of the educational system. So at this present moment, we have about 50 people who are attending meetings, sending emails, and doing what needs to be done. All right. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, a little bit about um, one of the objectives of the association being to also provide networking and support for um, counselors. So perhaps um, all of you might want to share some of your experiences as counselors and as a part of the association, how, it's, um, how you found being a part of the association. So, um, maybe, Crystal, you can uh, just take the lead there. <laughs> for 
for networking, I would say one of the big ones through school counseling that we have seen is as a result of referrals, mm -hmm. we make a lot of contact with um, like the human services, um, other areas within the ministry, Ministry of Education in terms of truancy, um, or we would tap into some other NGOs when it comes to maybe a student maybe needing personal assistance when it comes to the lack of necessities, you know, like food, clothing, etc. So as members of the organization or as school counselors, in that aspect, we definitely tap into those forms of networks when it comes to having to refer students out when maybe there is an academic or behavioral issue as a result of them not having, you know, the daily requirements. Mm -hmm. um, on another networking that we do is network with other um, schools. So for example, State Vernon would um, network with Excelsior and Maud Williams. So whenever we have different programs, um, we will lend support in terms of colleagues and resources as well. Mm -hmm. We also have a local area networks, so schools within the area. So it would be Westley, St. Vernon, Excelsior, Gwenlis, like the counselors would have a general meeting and share ideas and, you know, bounce off each other. So we do network with each other as counselors as well. And we have meetings and trainings together throughout the year. Um, in August, we have professional development just for counselors. There is a week in August, the first week in August, where all of us as teachers are at workshops, but we have that special week for counselors. So we cater to the needs of our counselors throughout the year. We gather information as to what their needs are, and we try our best to cater to those needs, those training needs during that time. We also have our AGM most of the time in October, um, since September is our celebrations month, so a lot is going on then. And a lot of the times during our meetings, we find that we share a lot of information, we share a lot of ideas. We also have a WhatsApp chat group um, that it's not just for school counselors, but for other partners, as Crystal had mentioned, some of these partners that are in that WhatsApp group. So we share a lot of information through there as well. All right. Um, you did mention also earlier um, talking about uh, the foundation's work to get the position of counselor to be um, I suppose, for lack of a better word, recognized as its own thing. Mm -hmm. And you also spoke about uh, part of the reason for that is that often um, the counselors have split responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, they're teaching or they may have other things. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps you could t uh, tell us um, a little bit what the ideal scenario would be for um, the, sc uh, the school counselor. So ideally, um, we. Building for Billy School Counselor Association, we have pulled a lot of information from the American School Counselor Association. We have also looked at school counselor associations within the region, within the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And ideally, the ratio of student to counselor should be 1 to 250. Mm -hmm. um, we know that's not necessarily the case. We have high schools with upwards of 900 students, so one counselor is not really as effective as he or she can be. But the counselor should be working on teaching life skills and coordinating the life skills department for the school. We also should be doing a lot of preventative work in terms of academic, personal, and social development and career development. And then we would cater to intervention needs of our students. But the work should not be mostly intervention. Mm -hmm. And that's what we find ourselves doing because of the population that we have, because of the workload that we have. We have um, teachers, like I mentioned, counselors, like I mentioned earlier, who are heads of departments, who are teaching other subjects that they have to grade papers, prepare exams, and all that. So it really takes away from dealing with students. So you have a situation where counselors would have to prioritize which students are in dire need and try to work with those students first. You know, and then some students get left behind in that process. Mm. Well, I mean, having said that, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know sort of what uh, you all's, you know, personal experience is like having been in the position, you know. Um, what's, what's a day in the life <laughs> like for, for each one? You know, what are the types of experiences that you all have had, you know, as in your years or in your experience, I should say, as, as, as counselors? I'm in the primary schools and they're in the high school. So my experience is a bit different because I am attached to a management. So I'm not in one particular school. I work with the government primary schools in Belize district. So yesterday I was in Lucky Strike. Today I will be at Stella Maris. Tomorrow I'll be at Biscayne. Um, so it's really, it's difficult sometimes to really plan, prepare for all these different schools. Um, 
And like today, I have groups at Stella Maris. I have a full day of groups. And then I'll take like half hour to an hour in the evening to really try to plan and prepare everything that I need for my visit to Biscayne tomorrow because my office is in Stella Maris. So when I leave Stella Maris this evening, I need to make sure I have everything with me that I will need for my visit to Biscayne tomorrow. And then there is the, the problem of my reports. Then what time do I have to do reports? So I have a, I also work with Hatteville, um, the River Valley area. So I have five schools that I'm working with. I try to reach them two to three weeks at least, one time in two to three weeks. So it becomes difficult when it's time to report all that I've been doing mm -hmm. since I'm traveling so much. Um, but for me at this point, I am just, we're in February, my referrals are just getting to that point where I'm working individually because I didn't have as much referrals between September and December. So I was able to do a lot of preventative work from September to December, getting into all the classrooms and all of these schools explaining my role as the counselor, explaining that if I get a referral, these are the reasons that you would be referred to me. This is what I would do in the event that I get a referral. Um, this is talk about confidentiality and what that means and what the limits of confidentiality are. So at this point now, my caseload is changing, so I'm switching into intervention work. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more intervention, intervention, and I don't have time to do any preventative work working with these different schools. For me, <coughs> ideally, it would be having two counselors at Westlip because of her population, 750. So, so three. three <laughs> <laughs> yes, three, but you know, <laughs> when is that going to happen? So I feel like I wear three hats. So I teach life skills to all first and two second form classes. And then I also plan events and we do a lot of whole school activities. I just finished with Fort Farm Career Day and then I'm going to start, well, this week is School Counseling Association Week, and then after that, it's Second Form Career Day as well. And then there's the counseling one-on-one -on -one sessions that I do and groups. So it's like, you know, the, the event planning, like there could be someone at the school who would just plan all those events. Yeah. And I do the life skills and then also the counseling sessions as well. So ideally it would be someone for first and second, to cater for those student needs, and then someone for third and fourth to cater for those mm, yeah, nice upper division. Um, for me, I am a <laughs> unique case because I teach like schools to second, third, and fourth farm. Okay. And I also have one social studies fourth farm. <clears throat> Beside that, I am responsible for programs for students, programs for the staff. Um, I am the sports coordinator. I deal with the high school festival of arts. So basically, I do my workload on That's any given trades. day. And, <laughs> yeah. and um, for the week, I have 18 sessions. Okay. Right? So I have a workload. Yes, this population is about 150, but the workload, um, I have a lot. And then I'm also seen as an administrator in terms of discipline. So I have to assist admin in that area as well. Okay. Okay. All right, and on, on my end, I. As Maricelli rightly said, I, I think ideally we would need two, two school counselors. We have a population of a little bit over 400 um, on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to teaching life skill classes to four first and four second farms within a cycle, which is six days, I have eight classes. In addition to, as my colleagues have rightly said, um, you have your one-on-one -on -one sessions or your group sessions. In addition to having maybe those emergency sessions where you have already planned your day and you have to prioritize those and how do you tell students that you have already scheduled for the day, listen, something more important came up and I need to address that. Um, for me, especially this month and last month has been very hectic because I'm prepping for career week, which is next week. So that's a lot of preparation, a lot of hours, a lot of typing, a lot of writing, a lot of reading. <laughs> so. It is a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So, well, yes, so you all sound like you're spread a bit thin. Yes. So, hence the importance of the association. And I guess um, we can now jump into the conversation about um, the Awareness Week, and you can tell us all about that and what uh, it's all about. So, at this point, it's still more something that counselors are doing individually in their schools. Like I mentioned, there is only a small amount of us. Um, and even as executive members of the association, we still have our day-to-day -day tasks that we have to do. So, this is an aside where we, have, we are already spread thin. And we try to put as much effort as we can into doing awareness. So, we have 
sent um, an email to our members as giving them a list of suggested activities that they can do within their schools. Um, one of those things would be a special assembly this week or a special mass if that is already in the plans for this week around the team. Our team for this week is school counseling, um, helping students to navigate a changing world. Mm -hmm. So um, we have one particular counselor who is at the tertiary level, Lupita Gillett. She is at Sacred Heart Junior College and she has really run with School Counseling Awareness Week. She has a whole list of activities for the week. Um, she also has gotten the support of pair helpers and the student body, I believe, and they had a special mass. They have a poster competition and different things happening throughout this week. But it's really just for school counselors to highlight the work that they do within their schools because a lot of our teachers still at present day are not really sure what does the school counselor do. Mm -hmm. So we have asked them to do some kind of awareness so that the students may be more aware because they access the service, but our staff members aren't fully aware of what happens. So we've been trying to get them to take a more, uh, a more leadership role and advocate for their, the, the things that they need in their schools and how they can work in their schools. We're hoping to have, in around the end of April, the beginning of May, to have a sort of cocktail hour where we're able to highlight the association and the work that our counselors are doing and actually to share some data in terms of you know, this is the amount of referrals we have, this is the additional responsibilities we have, and to give our counselors a little time to just relax and mm -hmm. network and share. And what's the, um, how has the membership of the association um, been, uh, how, that's, what's the word, how have they uh, reacted to um, the week in terms of getting um, activities prepared and, um, you know, spreading awareness, I should say. We're getting there. This is just, this is the third year that we've highlighted School Counseling Awareness Week. So it's been, we haven't seen as much shared because as we mentioned, we have so much already to do and some people are coming off career week. Mm -hmm. um, I know in the first term or first semester, we had a lot of drug awareness week. We had bullying prevention week. So it's to get them to realize the importance of School Counseling Awareness Week and put on a week of events just like they do for these other weeks. But we're getting there slowly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of spreading awareness, do you find that um, in your work that the students themselves have recognized the need for, um, you know, accessing counseling services? Um, is it anything that you've seen that's growing or the numbers changing in, in, in over the years? Um, maybe I could share that yeah. for so this week, one of my aim is to bring awareness in terms of um, counseling because there is still a stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. So when students would come for maybe individual or group session, I literally have to be running mm -hmm. and asking the warden's assistant to not allow them to um, run off the, um, to exit the compound because they don't see the need for counseling, mm -hmm. right? In their mind, counseling they are for crazy people and they don't have any issue, mm -hmm. right? And so even um, during orientation, I asked administration for a week to um, educate them on the role of school counselors, what we do, what is expected of them, and um, all the stakeholders who are there for the benefit of them, right? But there is a still there is still a, a negative um, connotation, connotation attached to it. Mm -hmm. I find because I teach life skills to all the first formers, that's what I do. I introduce myself as the school counselor and so I go over what my role is, you know, my purpose, why I'm there. So I feel that I am accessed. Other programs that I work with is with the PNP nurses. I work with Nurse Bennett and so she has nurses that come in and they help with the life skill classes to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. So we're working with Ministry of Health and a men mental health literacy program. So the first session was about, you know, that stigma of crazy, not calling people crazy, but someone with a mental illness. And then if we have those students go out and talk about it, talk to their parents, you know, that's spreading the awareness. I've also done mindfulness courses with Jerry Enriquez, and that's under the Ministry of Education. So we do mindfulness during my life school class and it's just about centering yourselves, breathing and just learning how to relax and just be calm, especially in those moments when teenagers, they're home hormonal, you know, they get angry. So it's about that self-regulation for them. And for you, Crystal? And for me, I have been, as Samson mentioned, I've spent this week um, teaching my first farm classes mainly about the importance of a school counselor, introducing myself, 
again because I had done that at the beginning <laughs> of the school year. So introducing myself and telling them the relevance of a school counselor. Um, within the past, well, I've been at Palo Alto High School for now my second academic year and the support from admin and teachers from last school year compared to now is by far a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. In addition to students and parents as well, I have this open door policy when I don't have sessions. So rarely I would eat lunch or have my break. Mm -hmm. So I would give that time to students to have them understand that, okay, you can always go to Miss Jones, go to her, talk to her, even if it's to express that, okay, I got 100% on a test today yeah. mm -hmm. and I haven't had gotten a 100% in months. Mm -hmm. So even something like that. So that's my biggest way of trying to build that level of awareness. And in addition, whenever I would get time, I would print maybe um, informative information and then I'll share it with teachers or I will send a text or an email and say, you know, hit me up whenever there is a concern in the class, let me know so that I could reach out to, you know, your students. Mm -hmm. And have you found um, on the other side of things that perhaps other teachers or other people who have perhaps been um, educated in sort of psychology or, or things like that, have, have, they, have you seen any um, growing or any um, change in the level of interest in people actually wanting to become counselors or get that sort of training? Um, our Facebook page has received a lot of questions in terms of being hired as a counselor and mm -hmm. what you need for counseling. Um, so it's, it's been something that slowly trickling in. We see more and more people asking about it. Um, I think the fact that we have a psychology program at St. John's, I believe it is, at the sixth form level, is getting there too. Um, I think one of the things that we also need to do is to tap into these, these, aware, these career weeks that our counselors are having in their schools. And I know that they're getting counselors to come in apart from themselves to also talk about counseling. Um, I also lecture at UB sometimes, so I do bring awareness to the Counseling Association. To, I do intro to psychology, so I also talk about counseling there. But I think the stigma, while the stigma is still there, I think it's less than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So I think more and more people are understanding the need for counselors, especially in our society today. All of us here today are, pres are in Belize City. So we have to deal with a lot of grief, we have to deal with a lot of trauma, we have, we have to deal with that in our schools. So I think the fact that all of these things are happening in our society, people are becoming more aware and are understanding, you know what, this is something that we really need. Mm -hmm. I think for those of us who, who comes from a co-ed institution, we have, if you look at the data, I would, it will show more that um, males don't access counseling. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? They don't see the need for it. Right? So. I think the mental health talks that we're doing mm -hmm. will kind of help with that as well, to let them understand that it's not about... One of the things that I keep stressing, and um, I, we have a website, Belize School Counselor Association. If you Google that, it will come up. Mm -hmm. We also have a Facebook page. But one of the things that I'm trying to do and I'm trying to encourage our counselors to do as well is to market themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we have the, the website that we've developed is something that we're managing. Um, when I completed my master's degree, I had to do an online portfolio, so I had to build a website. So I brought that back with me to the association so that we can put this information out there. But I'm also working on my personal website, my same portfolio from my master's degree. I'm transforming into a a website about the work that I do at government primary schools and I'm highlighting what exactly counseling is so that people can understand it's not just for people with this mental illness or crazy people it's for people throughout our lives throughout our development we face issues sometimes that we ourselves can't deal with mm -hmm. and for most of us or for a lot of us we're fortunate enough to have people in our lives that we can run to and talk to that is almost a form of counseling mm -hmm. We're talking to somebody, we're venting, we're bouncing ideas off them. It's not that the counselors will come and give you a prescription like doctors and say, this is what you need and this will fix the situation. Mm -hmm. But it's having somebody there to listen to you, to provide you with that helping ear. And it might be something that we've all had those moments where we're struggling with something and the moment we start talking out loud about it, sometimes we come up with their own, their own solutions mm -hmm. to these problems, but we need that listening ear. Yeah. And do you find that um, in your work that when the student actually does, you know, take the initiative to access uh, counseling, are they forthcoming? Are they honest? Do you get a lot of very personal stories? <laughs> um, I would be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think the only time students would come for counseling, it's when the principal <coughs> or maybe the board mandated to occur mm -hmm. because they're on the verge of getting a not to return. Mm -hmm. So they must um, attend the counseling session. Um, for me, a few um, cases I have walk-ins by students, and then 
the other teachers would make referral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of self-referrals as well. I have peer helpers and so they refer students as well. Okay. So sometimes it's groups and I do parent sessions as well. So with the family. So, okay. you know, and with teachers, I work very closely with the teachers. So I get referrals from them. And it's about, you know, counseling and something to help you. It's more like you're in counseling because someone cares about you yeah. and we want to help you to succeed for your future and for you to go down the right path. So it's something positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, I have gotten, as I mentioned earlier, great support from teachers when it comes to referrals. Like Maricely said, I do get a lot of self referrals. A lot of students, they now understand that, you know, it's okay to go and talk to somebody um, because too often I would find students, they would come to me and they would say, Miss, I just found myself crying and I can't understand why. And I would try to explain to them, it's because you haven't been venting, you haven't been talking. So all of these emotions are so caught up inside that now the only way that they can come out is either through anger, you beating up on someone, or you crying. But um, having them understand the need to refer themselves or ha also having parents. Uh, my number strangely became no secret. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, no secret to anyone. So I get parents who would call or text. I also have um, admin and teachers who would, you know, send me an email or a text message to say, please, you know, check in on this student, see what's going on. Right. And, you know, um, Carol, you also mentioned earlier that part of um, one of the initiatives of the association is also for the counselors themselves to get support because, you know, as you, as you said, you're constantly dealing with other people's problems. So mm -hmm. I imagine that after a while it does sort of weigh on you all as well. And then we have these lovely meetings where everybody gets <laughs> to talk to each other <laughs> and socialize. And um, The WhatsApp has proven very effective as well because that is a, in the past, we, it would be the executive that would be the one to reach out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Now that we have the WhatsApp group, everybody has everybody's contact information, so it's there. Um, and for the most part, most of our counselors have a little network. People either who have started working with, started working with them around the same time, or who are in their same area that they network it to provide that support. So that is one thing we are happy for, that we do have that where counselors are networking and getting the support that they need from each other. Right. And have you all sort of participated and benefited from that as well? Yeah. 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 yeah we have <laughs> gotten somehow close because mm -hmm. of the meetings and being able to tap into you know, each other's resource. So it, it, it has served us well. Right. And on that note, as I mentioned to you before we came on, um, this last night we actually had the passing of one of our founding members of the association, um, Ms. Elizabeth Goff. She was actually Marcella's predecessor at Wesley College. So this morning, I think from about after three this morning till before we came on here, the WhatsApp group was providing some sort of support for everybody to be able to share what they're feeling in terms of this sudden passing for us. Well, that, that of course was very unfortunate, yeah. but um, you know, what uh, better way to um, honor her than to continue the sort of the work yes. and you know keep blazing the trail. Yeah. And on that note, is there are there any specific sort of objectives or initiatives that um, you want uh, that the association is going to be doing over the next, uh, let's say, in 2020? Well, one of the things we would like our reminder to our members that data for the September to December period was due. Um, we want to be able to highlight data for the past three years in that um, cocktail hour that I mentioned coming up in April or May. So we would like anybody who's not a part of the association as counselors or somebody interested in counseling, because we do have an affiliate membership as well. So you don't have to be a school counselor, practicing school counselor to become a member. Um, you can find us on Facebook, you can find our website, Blee School Counselor Association, you can reach out to us and we will give you the information you need. And you don't have to be a member to participate in our trainings, to participate at our meetings. Um, we do have a mailing list for non-members that when we're having trainings, we send out the email to invite them to come in. So look us up and we can work forward to seeing how we can continue to develop and change school counseling in Blee. Right. And is that the, um, so that's 2020, is that sort of also the vision for the future or are there, are there other things that you would like that you want to see out of the, coming out of the association? Um, 
I would want to see more members. I would want to see us really work with the ministry to change that the, the Education Act and Education Rules and the mm -hmm. Pension Act to have the school counselor job description and the full list of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I'd like to see more trained counselors. We currently have counselors who are, well, the ministry is partnering at Bridgewater State University at this point, so we do have somebody going out every year getting a master's in mental health counseling. Um, so there is more training occurring, but we still need more trained people to work in our schools. Yeah, for sure. And is there any um, final message that you um, perhaps would want to leave with our viewers on behalf of the association or you know, on behalf of the schools that you work with um, that you can leave our viewers with? <laughs> for me, it's definitely to encourage not only my students and their family members, but individuals across the country of Belize to see the relevance of counseling, not only school counseling, but also professional counseling, see the need to talk to someone, see the need and the relevance of being able to confide in somebody, especially when it comes to the concept of confidentiality. So that's my biggest thing and, I, and that's one of my greatest messages that I will continue to sing and sing and <laughs> sing. <laughs> and for me, I would just ask um, young people to access counseling more and um, have parents buying as well and support mm -hmm. their, their children. Yeah. For me, it would be just, you know, to be a listening ear. Yes, we want, you have trained professionals, but you can just listen to your friends. Sometimes people don't want advice. They just want to vent, and you can, you know, vent to someone. I know right now, Wesley College is very sad because Elizabeth Goff was there for 23 years. She was the first counselor there. You know, she retired, and then I came on. And so that is a great loss for the profession. You know, her, it's a big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. And so for her to pass away, you know, during School Counseling Awareness Week, you know, it's just so sad. And we're going to be going through grief mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, so my final word is to be a listening ear. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. It's a very important one, as you, um, you know, mental health and the topic of accessing counseling and the similar services um, is becoming more recognized as being important um, as, you know, time passes by. So um, th these are members of the Belize School Counselors Association, and it is um, School Counselors Association Awareness Week, and we want to thank them for coming in today, telling us all about the activities of this week and that the foundation does in general. Um, we are going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we are going to be uh, joined by some canine friends to tell us all about uh, the results of the BDF dog show. And we, so I'm sure you don't want to miss that. So um, it's going to be super fun. So please stay tuned while we take our break. No tricks.
And we are back. Last week, we were joined by some uh, representatives of the Belize Defense Force, and they were telling us all about uh, the Belize Defense Force Day that was um, held last Saturday. And a big and exciting part of that event was the BDF Dog Show. And here to tell us all about how that went are some of the participants from the show. So we've got judges, and of course, as you can see, we've got some of the dogs here who've won some of the prizes. So um, with us this morning are <coughs> is uh, Colonel Anthony Velasquez, um, Assistant Superintendent uh, Brent Hamilton, and Kevin Thiessen. Good morning, and Good morning. thanks for joining us. And um, perhaps you can introduce our viewers to um, some of the <laughs> lucky winners. Uh, who, who is here with you? <laughs> well, this is Chiquita. She's a Chihuahua, three years old, and um, she won the, the first place for the smallest dog. OK. Yeah. And who's this? <laughs> this is Ajax. He is a half Labrador, half Boxer Cross. Two and a half years old, he won second place in, this, in the largest dog, dog class, as well as he won the Best of the Best award. All right. So. Um, perhaps you can uh, tell us all about the competition and how it went. <laughs> well, we, s we started off about three o'clock, mm -hmm. and we had like an early registration at two thirty. We had four. Uh, we had categories of smallest, largest dog, dog with the best trick, and we we also had um, the the best of the best, mm -hmm. and we had the best pet liquor. What was so fortunate that no pet liquor showed up, <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. No one didn't really enter any pet liquor, but. Um, what was so amusing to me, and I want to get this across, mm -hmm. that I really applaud the BDF for having a show like that because there were there was a lesson learned from the dog show also, right? Yeah. And um, we realized that um, there were there were a lot of dogs out there, but there were so many people with confidence that put the dogs in the different categories, mm -hmm. and the BDF had really tweaked the the event so that it could have been just try just just see what you can do. Uh, so um, walking around, and I did a little interview as the chief judge. Uh, um, I saw we, there's a need now for another dog show, which was like the like a show that we say best of breeds. Mm -hmm. uh, that will come soon. We will have that on stream. There's, it's a little bit of planning. Uh, we need to get a, a, a breed expert into the country, and I, we, we we will promote that. And we will say what we're going to do. But what I really wanted, what I the lesson that I really learned that um, we, have, we have dog handlers who was out there who administered their own medical, mm -hmm. do their own injection, or they got someone doing an injection. And I, I, wanted them, I wanted to alert it to them that they should be a vet only mm -hmm. because they could have been the wrong, um, wrong doses and they, lost it. they could have killed the dog and so forth. So that was, so that was one of the lessons learned. The other lesson learned, Training. Yeah. A lot of them didn't have tr uh, well trained as to obedience. So I have identified that many people need their dog to be obedient trained. Mm -hmm. Because it was a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. The dog have never been around a lot of dogs. Mm -hmm. They haven't been around a lot of people, a lot of people moving frisky, and they go into what we call like, uh, uh, activity mode. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know the surroundings. They're going to guard, they go to protection, and they handle So our training was one of the most, um, um, one, of the, one of the factors that we learned. And the third one, was that we realized that a lot of people, uh, we didn't ask for it, but after doing some interview, uh, where, where, where do you take a dog? Where, where do you get your dog get attended to? Well, how do you keep up with this medical record? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them do not do that. So uh, with this next, con this another dog show, that will, that will be definitely have to be the criteria, yeah. having the vet cars and to know what breed the dogs and so forth. But it was a, it was a very, very good day. Uh, we had a very good weather. We had barriers set up. Colonel, we organized it to have like a little ring. And when we said the dog show has start, look here, the people just crowd that um, thing. I one of the next things that I liked was when we did when we did the K9 demonstration for my police K9 unit, mm -hmm. and we asked people to participate to hide the drugs mm -hmm. or to move the box. And so they were wondering like, okay, this dog could go out and just. Wherever they, 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 they handle and the dog went somewhere else and they come back and the dog offended. So all those highlights of, we, we call our police canine service dog because they are a dog that has been trained. Uh, all of that came out good. But people were amazed of seeing this dog, the little small dog, the way he runs in the arena, <laughs> right? They, they all clap, right? And um, it, it, I, I couldn't say it, it was a success for me. The dev dog showed to me it was a very success. 
And um, we also want to hear, from, of course, from uh, some of the participants. How, what was it like you, for you and the Chiquita participating? It, it, it was great. Um, first time I participated with her in, in any dog show at all. And, um, and um, it was awesome. Um, the response from the public was, was just um, very encouraging. And um, Chiquita seemed to like the applause as well. I mean, when people were cheering <laughs> for her, yeah. She, yeah. She, she seemed to notice and started to prance out, you know. Yeah. So it was, it was awesome. A good day for, for, for my, myself, my family, and her to see her out there. And did you do any sort of, um, you know, preparation, training leading up to the event? No, not really. Um, basically, we just um, got her used to being around other people mm -hmm. besides myself, awesome. my wife, and my son. And um, she, 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 she performed well. I mean, at the end of the day, a bit of the stress caught up with her um, at the end, and she didn't want to walk for a little while. But otherwise than that, it was great. And um, she's socializing with more dogs, and it's mm -hmm. awesome. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And you, Kevin? How Likewise, it was the first time for me to mm -hmm. be at a dog show with, with Ajax. I've never, never done that before. Mm -hmm. I live at home on a small two-acre property. He doesn't see a lot of, a lot of other dogs. So That's right. what Mr. Hamilton was talking about is very much true, is that the dog isn't socialized. So it was definitely a challenge to just calm him down. <laughs> so because he was trying to rush at a few dogs, right? But um, it started out that way, but then as the day and more dogs came up, he kind of relaxed. And, and that's what I liked about him. Like I spent two weeks, a week and a half, really, that's all I did just to get him used to walking heel and stuff. Like I've done basic training before, mm -hmm. but to really be a little more, make it a little more intense and say, hey, I need you to be right here beside me. Mm -hmm. I did that two weeks and he picked it up so quick mm -hmm. and, and it was really cool. So he has, he's been a highlight from my wife and I. I okay. mean, he's, he's a watchdog at home. Um, he's friendly, but he puts on a really good show for, the, for, what, I, for what I need from him. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, to be out seeing dogs, what a big highlight for me for the dog show was, was like Mr. Hamilton said, there would have been nice to have more, comp more competitors. But what was really cool was there was so many different dogs that did show up. Mm -hmm. right? They weren't all in the show perhaps, but you saw a lot of bullies and pit bulls that were well yeah. taken care of. And that's what I love to see. As a dog owner, I take care of my dog. Right? I feed him the best dog food I can possibly feed him. It costs money, yes, but man, <laughs> to, to have it come back like that and to have other, see other people taking care of their dogs, beautiful event. I was very glad to be there. Right. And um, you as the chief judge, yes, what were some of the things that you were looking at when you were judging the competition? Well, it was easy for smallest dog with take one major in tape, yep. <laughs> right? And I will measure from, the, from, the, from, from his foot up to his, to his right here, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're not, we were not looking for that with the most pongs, yeah. <laughs> right? So we're looking at height, structure. Uh, we look at the activity of the dog. So we ask them that whenever they come into the, to the arena, I want to see the natural attitude of the dog, how he glands, so he, how his head is up. And so we're looking at activity. We had a vet there, Mr. Bennett, uh, thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, his, his responsibility was to look at the, 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 the medical head of the dog. So if he saw a lot of scratch, if he saw their, their teeth were not taken care of, whatever, he, he, he had a judge on that. And then we had a police instructor, who was my Carpal Carpal Cano. Uh, his job was to look at, see, just like what my friend talked about, how well the dog respond if they are saying walk, if they are saying heal. So we had, we, we had a little categories. Uh, that, that, the same rule apply for smallest and large dog. For the, the dog with the best trick, we had a, a, a dog, a shepherd that was out there. And what the guy did, he, he put like six, seven different blocks, mm -hmm. right? So your, your trick is supposed to wow me. Yeah. If you know wow me, I, I, I got my scoring system with like one to five, five with a bin high. So if you, if you impress me, well, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give. So the, but they had to say, what was your trick, trick. Yeah. right? So I, so I could look for it. If you tell me your dog's gonna jump and, out of a helicopter and repel, I, I'm gonna, I want to see that, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, so he put some blocks quickly and then um, what he did, he was just telling us how he does climb these blocks, come down, and then how he, how he put his foot and, and that's the way um, he went along with some other obedience, right? And then um, the, the other, we didn't have the fat lick up, uh, mm -hmm. I saw a lot, yeah. <laughs> but um, I tried to go wrong and explain, hey, fat lick just to help your dog, so forth, and I guess people just wanted to cool off. They didn't want mm -hmm. to be pressured. So I didn't pressure anybody. So we didn't have that. But we had mm -hmm. which dog could eat the most dog food fast. Yeah. <laughs> so we had two person came in. We got some canadine from our friend from Ramas. I said I want them to put some other. Uh, they had a like canned food. Mm -hmm. So give me more spice up. So when they yeah. reach it there, you know and. 
One of the dogs is here. He, it's, it's a winner. We have um, the sergeant from the BDF Roland. His dog didn't. The only thing that they, the, I think there was like, I don't know if it was a pong or a pong and a half. Was a yeah, there was a lot of dog food. <laughs> <laughs> and lesson learned, we put the dog food, but we didn't put water. Uh, right? If I, put, if I had put water, then we'd have probably been there longer. They will drink, they eat, they will mm -hmm. drink and eat. So the idea yeah. was to see. <laughs> so we know that the Canadian food is good. So um, that was one of the comments. Then we had the best of the best. Yeah. So we took all the winners from those categories. It was hard for the, for the, for the judge. And um, they have to walk around. Mm -hmm. We have to say, if this should have look better than this lab, um, this lab mix, mm -hmm. if you look better than Rion Dog, if you mm -hmm. look better than Shepherd, and it was a, a criteria that is very hard to, to uh, you might, something might have quarrels. Some people think <laughs> they that look better than the next dog. Yeah. <laughs> but what made his dog yeah. oh, stand, stands out is that we could have not found, like, um, uh, like some dog had like dog, dog bites. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, some dog, their, 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 their skin were falling off. Some, some. Uh, so that was, what, that was the edge that made him win because he was well coated, well shined. Well, alternative. So when they walk on, he still. Yeah. <laughs> so he still, and so he, his dog was, um, well, was pronounced the, the best of the best, right? So yeah. it was, it was, was very good. I, I, we move away from obedience, mm -hmm. and we saw that many people wanted to do obedience. So I was kind of wondering, okay, we didn't put, we move away from obedience last year because not everybody could have put the dog to sit to stay, to whatever the case might be. But it was mm -hmm. great, great, great. I'm also interested to kind of know what made you interested in participating in the competition. So, well, I'm, I'm a dog lover. That's yeah. the first thing. And um, uh, I've been to one show that um, Brent hosted before in um, Belmapan. So I saw a lot of people come out. And um, I, I saw where, I, you know, people in Belize really take care of the dogs. They love their dogs and they want to take them out to socialize with other dogs. So we decided to have the dog show this year. Um, not at the last minute, but um, with, with a few weeks to spare. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out great. Um, the big takeaway for us is um, many people came out for their dogs, so they want something like this. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's, there's a there's a there's a want in the society for for a dog show. So for that's sure. yeah, that's something to go of it. Yeah. yeah, for me the the desire to participate was basically uh, I have a beautiful dog and I, yeah. you know, I like to show him off, right? I'm proud of the way that that he has turned out and and to see that and definitely to socialize him as well and get him used to other dogs. Uh, so that was. Yeah, uh, having a good looking dog, you want to show them what they look like. For right? sure. <laughs> and was there anything that you guys maybe learned or some uh, special experience that you take away from being a part of the competition? Um, 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 love or of maybe something surprising that happened? <laughs> well, no, just love of dogs and not seeing other breeds out there and mm -hmm. people with their dogs, with well taken care of dogs, and um, to get to pet them and see them, um, see people's reaction to the dogs. Um, mm -hmm. Like the biggest dog was a huge dog, yeah. mm -hmm. like well over 150 pounds, and oh, um, wow. you know, to see the reaction of, um, um, yeah, <laughs> of everyone. So it was, that, that, that's my takeaway, just the joy mm -hmm. and the, the happiness and um, the appreciation that, that everybody brought to, to people. Yeah. I, w I would very much second that as well, to see so many dogs out and the way people are proud to show their dogs and, and, and um, display them. And then, like you said, the love for dogs. There is, as was mentioned before, there is so much opportunity for more dog shows. That, that when organized well and stuff, they can do very, very well. And so that was a big bonus for me. We'd love to see that happen more. Well, well I, I, I stress yeah. that as a chief judge and the, 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 the person who there with the, head, with the shoulders with all the responsibility to make sure that no incident happened. We had no incident. Okay. So I, I was part of safety. And so when you see like about 40 dogs or 50 dogs on a compound, the last thing you don't want to hear is one dog we call it loose dog. Yeah. And the handler is chasing the dog and in training the teacher that whenever a dog gets out of your hand mm -hmm. and, he, and he runs and you set chase behind him, he thinks that you are playing. Yeah. Yeah. He thinks that you are playing hide and seek. So he go first. <laughs> but if he saw his rival, like this dog and a dog, they might not like each other, just like human. Mm -hmm. And he get a chance to go, it was going to be a dog fight. Mm -hmm. And to go past a dog fight, someone is going to get bit because mm -hmm. someone going to go in there. And so I was, I was panicky. My, my thing was walking around trying to tell people, oh, you keep your dog there. Stay away from here. Mm -hmm. Hold. And then I learned that a lot of people didn't have leash handling skills. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for instance, like if, 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 I, if I hold the leash, like, I should have yeah, let me yours right here. Yeah. 
right? Just a little tip, a free tip, right? <laughs> Most people walk a dog like this. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. If this dog jerk you and you go, this is going to slip. Mm -hmm. and it's gone. The proper way to walk with a leash like this is take the thumb mm -hmm. and you put it here. And you keep this here. So when the dog pulls, this, this is a lock. Yeah. Your thumb became yeah. a lock on your hand. So your dog, you can't break your thumb. You cannot come out of that. So that was one of the most um, tips I gave out there because other people just have them with a, just have them in the hand and, and yeah. goes right. So, yeah. so I think um, we're going to step up the game. We're going to have a breeds dog show. I'm, I'm knocking my partner to my left. I'm knocking okay. you. I'm knocking <laughs> open eyes to be there. Okay. As for one hour, I will going to put uh, uh, the idea that I have is to put all aggressive dogs in a category. Mm -hmm. So if you have pit bull, Rottweiler, they will be in a, a category. Okay. Then we have the breed category. So if the dog is only pit. Then it's only pit. If it's only shepherd, it's only shepherd. If it's only Labrador, it's only Labrador. If it's only Chihuahua, it's only, and all the dogs that classify and I need the Chihuahua clients, right? Mm -hmm. So we go, I'm looking for for that because I I see a lot of Belize has. We are almost there with America. We are mm -hmm. almost there with having all these type of dogs. If you ask me how all these dogs migrates, mm -hmm. they came right from Mexico. They came off the plane, and mm -hmm. they have, we have an interaction. Just like if you go into our history, how we all came to as extent. So. Mm -hmm. So it definitely sounds like it was a fun-filled um, and learning uh, a, a filled day as well. And um, you know, you also had mentioned earlier that we we do have with us um, the dog who won the food eating competition, or who, yes, who could eat the fastest. Yes, so we're gonna um, go over right now, and we're going to talk to Sergeant Roland, and um, we're gonna meet his dog. So I'll just <laughs> head over here. Okay. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> All right. So, good morning, gentlemen. We have with us now, we have Sergeant um, Ryan Roland, and we're also joined by Kendall Reimer, who um, participated um, in this week. And we have the, um, and we have, and who's, and, who's, and who's this? Introduce him to our viewers. This is Bursky. Bursky? He is 22 months old, mm -hmm. almost, almost full 24. And I got him as a pup from one of my church sister, and she's he she she never wanted so many dogs in her in her yard. So mm -hmm. she said, you know what, guys, I have some pups, and I need to get rid of them. So I decided to say, you know what, let me have one. And he's actually a full breed pet bull. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad is is full breed. So the color, I love it because yeah. it, <laughs> out, it it outstands anything when it comes to the darkness of the night and yeah. whenever he's in the yard nobody can't see him at all all right yeah no this is good so and he won the who can eat the quickest um competition so did you know already from you know having raised him and stuff that he has a big appetite honestly yes i know <laughs> that he has a big appetite however you know i always feed him sometimes off the table mm -hmm. and with the pedigree mixed so whenever i feed him i will feed him with pong of chow mm -hmm. and that's it he always takes down all of it yeah <laughs> and so did you expect that he was going to win <laughs> i never expected it but when i saw his competitor i yeah. said you know what there's He's, no way <laughs> <laughs> there's no way he got this yeah and um you know uh um the superintendent or uh, assistant superintendent did mention that um you know, uh, they were eating um, some of the Canada foods, which you can see right here. And so perhaps, um, Kendall, you can tell us um, all about um, Reimers and uh, the food that we're seeing in front of us. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yeah, I'm Kendall Reimer here from Reimers Feed Mill. Mm -hmm. And um, we're really proud here to, to, to be part of the BDF Day. Mm -hmm. um, we did uh, participate on, on, the, on the event. We had our display there with our dog foods. Um, which we um, we call or we know that it's the best dog food out there, mm -hmm. um, and we want a dog like Ajax that we just saw that we just saw on the on the show was that um, that um, that he has been fed this Kennedy dog food and and the reason for him to be the dog that he is is because of Kennedy dog food, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so therefore, Reimers Fidma, we. Um, we have um, we have the pet supplies, whatever you need. We we care for dogs. That's why we are there. We are out throughout the whole country of Belize, 
supporting the dog lovers and everybody there to 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 feed the dog, right? Yeah. And we have, you know, we've got food, we have treats there that I can see. What makes the food uh, the best? Is it the Well, um, mm -hmm. the one on the, the Canada, which is the, the All Life Stages, yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty basic dog food. Um, the main ingredients, when we look at dog foods, we look at the ingredients first. And uh, when we see the dog food, um, it's the first ingredient that we, that, we, that we look at is chicken meal. Mm -hmm. um, the All Life Stages is made out of four main main formulas. It's made out of turkey, uh, chicken, lamb, and fish meal. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a high quality dog food. There's no corn, no soy in it, no grain. So um, it, makes it, it makes it a very, very high quality dog right. food mm -hmm. and it, that the dog can eat what he likes to eat, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, the yeah. So that's good. And um, so, Sergeant, I'm uh, interested, what made you sort of interested in participating in uh, the BDF dog show? Honestly, I was out there selling food. Oh, uh -huh. And my daughter came and said, you know what, Daddy, there is only two dogs. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go home for, 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 for Bruski? Because mm -hmm. his name is actually Bruski. I said, you know what, baby, Daddy never gone into a dog show before, never. Mm -hmm. So anyways, just for the love of it, I will go home for the dog. And I did. Mm -hmm. Not to find out that he was actually the third largest dog too. Oh wow. Okay. And also the best pot liquor, <laughs> <laughs> how they would say it. But he ate the most food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and was so it was a first time for me. Mm -hmm. And I, was the I love it. Like, it was I good? love it. It was a good experience. So yeah. looking forward for next year with God's willing. Yeah. And what was it also like, um, sort of, um, you know, seeing him um, associate with other dogs and I, and I suppose you meeting other dog owners as well? Well, I have basically always take him off the leash mm -hmm. and let him just run, run, run free. Um, it is something that I have never done before, but it was very okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so he did respect himself without any kind of official training per se. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I think as I said, the Kennedy dog food, it's definitely a dog food that every dog lover should, should, consider, to, should consider to feed their dogs. It is, it is just, it's a more expensive dog food like Kevin was saying earlier already, but the, the, the results that we're seeing in the dog food versus other dog foods, it is definitely worth it um, feeding feeding the Kennedy dog food. If we do the comparison of the feeding, of any other dog food, feeding it. it um, okay. You can pick it up and show the camera. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah this, if, we, if we take this dog food and we compare the price with any other dog food, if mm -hmm. we do the feeding rate, it's not really that much more expensive than any, than the other, any other dog food. Yeah. So we do have other, other dog foods as well, like the, this is a, it's a chicken meal and rice formula. Um, it's also, it's mainly chicken, yeah, chicken and meal, the chicken and rice. So um, they have the all life stages. All life stages it means for all ages, sizes, and breeds. So it does, there's no specific puppy formula or something. Um, the this one here is the um, the lamb. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It has more lamb in it, but it's all of those three go as a high quality dog food. And besides the dog foods, um, those dry dog foods, we do have the canned dog foods mm -hmm. as well, the, the Kennedy can, canned dog foods. We do have the snacks, when the dogs do some tricks or whatever, you can give them a little snack. Mm -hmm. Candies, we could call them. Candy, um, yeah. <laughs> besides the snacks, we do have toys, balls, throwing them, um, have the dog go catch them. And also we have other um, treats for our dogs. And the list goes on and on. We have, come check us out, ch check our stores when we have everything you need, right? So it's, I know when a dog lover comes into our stores, he's there for a reason and he likes it, right? Mm -hmm. So. And you said you're countrywide as well, right? That's right, we're countrywide, yes. All right. Okay, so um, we um, also 
Again, we want to thank um, the uh, members of the BDF and the participants of the dog show who um, did participate in the show that was held on Saturday. Um, you know, we had, we saw the smallest dog, we saw the second biggest dog, and we were also joined by uh, the best in breed. We also want to thank Sergeant um, Roland for coming, showing us Brewski, the dog with the biggest appetite, and of course, um, Kendall Reimer, um, for um, sharing um, all the information about the Canada Foods and all of the products that you can find at Rhymers. If you're a dog lover, an animal lover, um, there's so much um, you can find there. So gentlemen, thank you for um, mm -hmm. coming on thank the show. You. It was a pleasure to have you. Um, so um, that was it. We heard all about it. And we have one final break, and we are going to come back with um, our show's wrap up. So do stay tuned. Over 100 years of service excellence in Belize, the Belize Bank. When someone you love becomes a
Are you ready? Poses. And we are back. Um, we had another great show today. We hope that you watched all of our segments. We want to thank all of our guests for coming in and making today a really special show. Of course, it's Thursday. It's almost the weekend. We're getting ready for our weekend plans. Um, but we hope that you did enjoy some of the conversations that we had this morning. So uh, we first want to say thank you to Paola Andre, who of course you may know as our former ambassador for the EU, from the EU to Belize, and she's the executive director of the EU um, Latin American and the Caribbean Foundation, which of course is a new foundation that um, hopes to foster a whole lot of uh, better relations between the Caribbean and Latin American region and the European Union region. So we want to thank her for um, coming in this morning and giving um, us a great talk about um, all there is to learn about the foundation and of course ways in which you can apply um, to uh, participate in some of their initiatives. We would also like to extend a big thanks to the Belize School Counselors Association. Um, some of their representatives did come this morning. It is School Counselors Association, um, Association Awareness Week. They um, have been doing a lot of initiatives um, and are planning a lot on the way forward, um, recognizing the importance of mental health and counseling services in our schools and in general in Belize. And of course, um, we also want to say a big thank you to the winners uh, and the participants in the BDF Dog Show competition. It was a lot of fun on Saturday. So we had, of course, we had the smallest dog, we had the best of the best. We also had the dog with the best appetite. Um, so we want to thank um, both the dog owners and um, the dogs themselves for joining us uh, this morning and also Assistant uh, Superintendent um, Hamilton who was uh, the chief judge and um, organizer of Saturday's activity. So we definitely had a lot of fun today but that is our show for today. So if you want to contact us, you can contact us via email at oie at channel5belize.com. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook at Open Your Eyes Belize um, and also on Instagram at OIE Belize. Um, so um, with that, please make sure if you enjoyed today, uh, make sure that you tune in tomorrow at 6.30 a.m. when you open your eyes, start your morning, right? Um, but until then, uh, please keep your eyes, mind, and your heart open. Uh, so we'll see you soon and enjoy your day, Belize. Open Your Eyes was brought to you by the Belize Bank, our country, your bank.